I've been flying for quite a long time. And I've been taking photographs for as long as I can remember. It's a whole different world from up there. You just see things that nobody else can see. I feel quite privileged, really. And yeah, you certainly notice things changing. Britain from the air, our green and pleasant land. But the view below is of a landscape transformed over the 70 years of the Queen's reign. And what better place to witness the changes than flying over the Garden of England, Kent. So this is a 1960s shot. Look how many orchards there are there, how many trees there are there. Um, and it was, lots of Kent was like, like this. Um, whereas this is, this is what it looks like now. There's hardly a tree to be seen. You know, one minute you're going past and it's an ice cream field. The next time you fly, you know, they've scraped all the earth off. The next time you go past, there's machinery on it, you know, and the buildings are going up. Look at the difference. That's actually the same shot, the same, exactly the same. And then this is what it looks like now. That's been totally obliterated. You've got the M2, the M20, the M25, always been built since the 60s. I like nice patterns from the sky, but they do cut through the landscape. The poet Philip Larkin warned that all this was going, going. That concrete and tires would smother our green land. The shadows, the meadows, the lanes. And that will be England, gone. The last 70 years have been a period of immense change. The green turning grey as the motor car became king. Roads and motorways steamrollering across the countryside. Urban sprawl, the result of rising population. The post-war drive for self-sufficiency industrialising the way we farmed. Hedgerows and wild flowers swept aside as big machines needed big open fields sprayed with chemicals. And then the silent spring, the age of extinction in these decades since, threatening more than one in seven of our species, a quarter of all mammals at risk. The 44 million birds absent from our skies, the 97% of wildflower meadows gone and the collapse of insect life. There are those some winners, the return of red kites, bitterns, ospreys, an explosion of goldfinches and the arrival of little egrets, all highlighted by the RSPB this jubilee. Yet the red list of birds threatened with extinction has doubled in 25 years. The losers, turtle doves, swifts, curlews, corncrakes and puffins. The sights and sounds of our countryside and coast are changing irrevocably. Just as Larkin predicted, our green and pleasant land lingers on in galleries and has been confined to the pages of books. I love these ladybird books. I, I love the illustrations done by Tanner Cliff. Every single one kind of transports you back to this time, which wasn't all that long ago, really. It's only 60 to 70 years ago, when there was so much abundance. And it dawned on me that this book isn't kind of some pretend fanciful thing. That really was how it used to be years ago. There really were that many swallows and swifts. And it's not like that anymore. This page really gets to me because I remember a time when there used to be hedgehogs. Because so I used to watch them in our garden, out the back gate as it was getting dark. And I just wish that I could see all this abundant life now, the way it used to be then. I just, it makes me sad that it's not there anymore. When my grandfather bought this farm in 1958, the first thing that he did was he bought himself a John Deere Model B tractor and he set about making the farm more workable and that meant taking out hedgerows to make fields bigger so his tractor could get up and down. And farmland wildlife has really suffered as a result. 70 years of a landscape falling silent is driving a movement to turn back the clock to the old ways, restoring patchworks of habitat that work for farmers and nature too. You can see hedges all around us are hedges that we've put back in. Chapper used to work on the farm who retired in his mid 80s, laughed at us putting this hedge back in because it was one that he'd spent so much time bulldozing out.
But then at the same time, he also said he remembered there being corncrakes on the farm. Corncrakes are long gone from our landscape, so maybe there's something in that that kind of shows actually the damage that was done. But that's why we want to be able to reinstate some of these features and, and make sure that we have a farm now that sustains the farmland wildlife that we really want. I think about things that my grandparents told me about how there was rolling countryside, greenery, birdsong extending so far, and that's been lost. And uh, in some ways, all of it can't come back. Places like this have fared better at holding on to their nature. Wiccan Fen is the country's oldest nature reserve. In fact, all our national parks have been created during the Queen's reign. But these pockets of protected landscape have fast become islands oases surrounded by wildlife wastelands. Wiccan's become a little fragment of a lost landscape that you can come and go back in time when you come here, but actually beyond its borders, it's very fragile and it's not surrounded by that buffer that it once would have done. It does give you a sense of sadness, but also a sense of hope and actually determination that we need to create more space, we need to create more habitat and join up more of these nature reserves that you can come and experience, but actually make it much better for wildlife and therefore better for people. Since the coronation, our landscape has been transformed. And these days, sadly, the countryside is a quieter, depleted place. Now, we can't get back everything that we've lost, which means it is imperative to protect what we still have, because the next 70 years represent the gravest threat yet to life on Earth and how we respond to the twin crisis of ecology and climate will determine the future of this sceptered isle. Alex Thompson reporting. Well, Jake Fines is conservation manager at Holcombe in Norfolk, one of the country's largest historic country estates. I spoke to him earlier and began by asking how we can balance our need for cheap food and accessible housing while also preserving nature. We've seen huge declines in habitats and biodiversity in the last 70 years, and we cannot deny that. And this is not necessarily just in the UK, but globally. And as a global family, we have to work together for the next 70 years to actually make a difference to ensure that our children's children live in a place that we once remembered. And we do have the technology. Humanity over the past 50 years has come on leaps and bounds. So we know we can we have the ability to make changes for the benefit and not to the detriment of our natural environment. And, I mean, you're a great advocate of rewilding. Um, what about the royal family? Is the royal family doing enough? Specifically Prince Charles, who's been ahead of the curve on so many environmental issues, do you think that he should also be ahead of the curve when it comes to rewilding, planting more trees, you know, on his, you know, thousands of acres and hectares of estates? Rewild, the definition of rewilding has been has somewhat changed in the last few years. We have wonderful examples in the south of England where estates have made significant space for nature. But actually, some people consider the planting of a hay meadow as rewild. But actually, technically, that's agriculture. So we need to be we need a range of approaches and must not specifically target one type of approach, seeing that as a silver bullet because the natural world requires heterogeneity in its management of approaches. All right, so a kind of a radical wholesale approach is not, the, is not a good idea. We have to be, you know, much more detailed, you know, in our you know, view of how we transform the British landscape, basically. So it's about nuance and context. It's about understanding uh, where, where we're putting it and why we're putting it there, not just suddenly planting up vast areas uh, in, in, in Sitka spruce or planting uh, deciduous woodland that won't serve any benefit for another 70 years. So I think it's, mm. it's a measured approach, but I fully understand that we need to act, act imminently and uh, uh, promptly. So you're standing in the middle of a field in the Norfolk coast. I can't quite see what's behind you. Um, it looks pretty wild to me. Is the right thing happening to the field that you're standing in or should it have a different kind of use? So uh, I think the field I'm standing is the field of the future. This is a field with a hedgerow that is, was rich in blossom and will in the autumn be fruitful of, with red berries. 
I have buffered those with hay meadows and where we know that we have lost 90% of our hay meadows. So I'm recreating hay meadows within an arable landscape. I've got a field of sugar beet behind me, which has not had neonicotinoids applied to it, which has had a cover crop through the winter. This is sustainable environmental agriculture, and this is part of the solution. Part of the British DNA is the you know, famously clipped hedge and the clipped lawn. Do you think that we need to be less British in order to be nicer and kinder to nature? Absolutely. We need to, we need to change our approaches in, in all of the things and the way we lead our lives, whether that's the maintenance and management of the countryside and being less obsessive with uh, cutting on an annual basis. And fundamentally, this is down to policy. So farmers have particular reasons when they should cut their hedges and when they shouldn't. They join environmental schemes which say they should not cut their hedges more than one year in three. And fundamentally, we can widen that approach. And actually, that reduces our costs. So we look at the cost of uh, diesel. And actually, by, we can save money by making space for nature. And all of us need to apply that approach. No Mo May, a wonderful initiative taken up by so many. And people start to see the benefits. People start to see flowers growing in their gardens, butterflies feeding off the flowers. So then we get the health and well-being aspect that we need so greatly in our lives.